have traveled across the oceans. Some still feel the whipping sands. Left their families and all they hold dear to navigate through foreign lands. They fight with honor, no prima donna. With their unit by their side Brothers and sisters All enlisted For they believe in why they fight They fight for those who gave some They fight for those who gave all They fight for the many Whose names are on that wall they come home torn and tattered They should feel like it matters to me And it matters to you Before we watch another hero fall Say, take my hand Beside you I stand I stand tall Imagine being woken, much of them is broken. One event, their whole life has changed. A room lonely and sterile, they don't know if people care. What's happened to their bodies, all the visions in their brains. So they reach for the bottle, some reach for the trigger. They reach for any way out for the pain it seems bigger but what if when they reach out they find a helping hand what if there we stand saying you fought for those who gave some you fought for those who gave all you fought for the many whose names are on that wall I know you're torn and tattered, but I swear that it matters to me, it matters to me. Before I watch another hero fall, please take my hand. Beside you I stand, I stand tall. I pledge my support to the brave men and women of our military. They have served our country with honor, and it will be my honor to serve them and their families as they move forward through trying times. I fought for those who gave some. I fought for those who gave all. I fought for the many whose names are on that wall. I know I am torn and tattered, but it helps that I matter to you, so it matters to me. You won't see this warrior fall. You won't see this warrior fall. I stand tall. I stand tall. I stand tall Let's stand tall Good morning and welcome to Matthews United Methodist Church. Uh, welcome to a contemporary service. My name is John Woodall. I'm one of the leaders here at the church. We're so glad that you're joining us this morning. If you have a candle ready to light, come on and join us. We're excited about the music we have prepared for you. It's going to be a fun day of worship. Thank you for being here with us.
was buried beneath my shame. sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now you're Friends, as we continue our time in worship, we celebrate the reality that we live in the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And now as a people who have been forgiven, we take time to share the peace of Jesus with one another. So may the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you and you. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, Matthews United Methodist Church. May the peace of Christ be with you. 
May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you today and always. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And you. allow me to uh, add my welcome to the one that Jill shared earlier to all of you who are worshiping with us uh, right now. And a special welcome to all of you who may be guests visiting with us for the first time. Uh, We would love to have the opportunity to get to know you uh, a little bit more and for you to be able to get to know us as well. So if you could take a moment to fill out the guest connection form, uh, as well as subscribing to our Friday Celebration News, where you will be able to find our most most current list of updated events uh, and announcements. Uh, You can find all of that by going to our website, matthewsumc.org, and clicking on the Connect tab. Friends, we don't want you to miss any of our times together in worship. So we do invite you to subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel and to set your notifications to begin just before the 9.30 service or the 11 o'clock service. You can also uh, be able to watch live by going to Facebook Live. If you haven't uh, taken the opportunity to do so already, please do take a moment to let us know that you're worshiping with us. You can do that by going to our Sunday morning email or simply by uh, writing your name and those that are worshiping there with you in the comments section. Friends, it is certainly a gift for us to be a community of faith. And one of the things that we do as a community of faith is sharing gratitude to those that are among us. Uh, And some gratitude this week is owed to all of our veterans as we get ready to celebrate Veterans Day in just a few days. So do consider sending them a note of thanks or giving them a a phone call, those that may be in your, uh, your, your circle of friends, a Sunday school class or whatever. Do take time to let them know uh, how thankful that you are for their service. One final announcement for us is that on Sunday, November 23rd at 7 p.m., we will be having our annual charge conference. Now this year we're going to need to do it virtually, so please do look for the Zoom link that will be found uh, on our website as the time approaches. Friends, now we're going to turn our attention to going to God in prayer, taking advantage of this wonderful gift that is given to us as children of God, knowing that our Creator uh, not only hears our prayers, but responds to them. Let us pray. God, we come together again this morning with united hearts to worship the one who alone is worthy to be praised. God, we come to consider your greatness. We come to thank you for all that you have done, to thank you for sharing your goodness, your mercy, and your love with all that you have created. And God, we thank you for the gospel, for the good news that the God who created heaven and earth loves us more than we could ever hope for or imagine. For the good news that the one and only Son of God came to to walk among us so that we might have abundant life. And for the good news that the Holy Spirit of God dwells among us even now so that we might be empowered to expand your kingdom here on earth. So Lord, we thank you for the good news that the God of all will never leave us nor forsake us. God, help us. Help us to reflect upon all of this good news each and every day. And God, we take time to to continue to pray for this nation. We're in the midst of such division, God. We ask for you through your Holy Spirit to work through us as your followers so that we might be a people of hope, of peace, of unity, and of love. And we take time as well to to give thanks for all of the veterans who are a part of our congregation and indeed throughout the country. God, we are grateful for their dedication, for their sacrifice, 
and for their willingness to serve so selflessly. We remain in their debt. And we pray as well this morning for those in our community who may be struggling with sickness and disease. Lord, they need your healing and your restoration. And we also pray for those who may have recently suffered the loss of a loved one. May they know that you are right there beside them as they mourn. And we pray for those who may feel alone and forgotten. Help them to realize that you love them with an everlasting love. And God, prompt us to offer them the love that they deserve. Lord, we praise you as the God of all things, as the one who gives us a solid foundation in uncertain times. We depend on you for our lives and ask for you to use each of us in ways that glorify your name. And we pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, now is the time in worship for those who consider Matthew's United Methodist Church to be your spiritual home, to extend your, your tithes and your special offerings to God. Because you give, we are able to, to provide a, a place here in Matthew's where those who are seeking to follow Jesus can learn more about who he is and to learn more about who we are in him. So we thank you in advance for giving generously and for giving joyfully. You certainly can continue to send your checks into the church, or you can give by going to Matthew's uh, UMC uh, slash give, or you can give through our uh, Realm platform. Again, uh, we thank you as we have this opportunity to join together with each other and with God by giving to God's work in the world. love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Christ, his death and resurrection. 
The scripture this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, from the NRSV. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge Titus that, as he had already made a beginning, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So good to have you in worship today, and thank you, Becky, so much for reading um, Holy Scripture for us, that beautiful lesson for today. Just a reminder today for sign-ups for our Advent study, I hope you'll do that. Uh, Karen and I are going to be leading a study. Others will be leading them at different times. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, an amazing Advent season this year, even in spite of a global pandemic we're going to make sure that the light of Christ shines brightly in our lives. So get signed up today. Be a part of it and how all of that matches up with our sermons for the weeks of Advent. In addition, as your thoughts have raced and run high through this election cycle, would you allow me this morning to offer just a few pastoral words of guidance and comfort? First of all, remember that the first thing that God did to bring order out of chaos was to take a breath. Genesis chapter 1. Let's all do the same. Secondly, elections are eventually decided, but they are not finish lines. They are mere mile markers in this long, hard road of perfecting our union. Elections remind us how divided we are, but they do not tell us that we have to remain that way. And then most importantly, remember that the kingdoms of this earth are ultimately inferior to the kingdom of God. Our primary allegiance is to God, not to a 
political systems, and we should not turn to them to bring us the kind of ultimate security that only God can provide. Many of you know how much I love the Celtic tradition. And I found this prayer, and I'd like to pray it for all of us. And now, if you would, please join me. O sun behind all suns, O soul within all souls, grant me the grace of the dawn's glory. Grant me the strength of the sun's rays, that I may be well in my own soul and part of the world's healing this day. That I may be well in my own soul and part of the world's healing this day. Amen. And now may you be well in your soul and be part of the world's healing this day and every day to come. Well, grace is one of the most beautiful words in the entire English language. It, it, it connotes effortless effort. We know people who walk in grace, don't we? I mean, I think of some of my favorite sports heroes, uh, uh, and there are those that play center field or run the basketball court or swing a golf club with grace. And so when I think of grace, I always think of that old movie with Gene Kelly with his umbrella singing in the rain, dancing down the street, grace in motion. Now the Bible says that we are saved by grace. Now fortunately, it's not our grace, but it's God's grace. God's free, unmerited favor toward us by which we are saved. So that when we come to God, we experience something like southern hospitality. We're graciously received. And this is the message of the good news gospel that goes forth from churches throughout the world, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, 11 months out of the year. And then comes October, November. It's stewardship, generosity time. And instead of grace, what we hear is guilt. And I'll confess that I too have been a guilt monger as a preacher during generosity season at times in my own life. I, I remember as a young preacher preparing sermons at this time of the year, and I would always go to my bookshelf and I would, would pull down a book of martyr stories of Christians who were sawn in two or thrown to the lions or torn apart by wild dogs. And I would say, no, I, I'm not asking you to be burned at the stake. I, I'm just asking you to fill out a pledge card. If you really love Jesus. So many of the members of my churches would take a vacation during October, November for some reason. <laughs> for, you see, friends, guilt cannot be the reason that we give to God. Grace teaches us to give. And that's the theme of this morning's scripture lesson. One of the most marvelous and beautiful passages in all of the letters of the Apostle Paul. Now here the Apostle Paul illumines the theme of Christian giving, and he, and he does so in a particular context. Now we should keep in mind that when we open one of Paul's letters, we're reading somebody else's mail. This is a letter that Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and the Corinthians are a nation of Greece, and he writes to them at a time when fa famine has devastated the church of Jerusalem. Palestine has been laid low, and the Christians of Jerusalem are unable to feed their families. And Paul is writing to the various churches in the Gentile areas of the Middle East. Now, in the early days of the church, the Jerusalem church, the mother church, well, it was very standoffish and defensive towards these Gentile upstart churches that were springing up all around the Mediterranean. And they did not want to have any part of this new movement of Christianity into the Gentile world. 
But now we have a setting in which those Jerusalem Christians are in dire need. Now here, you can just see the light bulb come, come on over the Apostle Paul's head. And he says, what an opportunity. Because if I can get all of the Gentile churches to begin channeling resources and start giving to the Jerusalem Christians who are now in this very difficult situation, then think of the goodwill that that will result. Think of the barriers that will be smashed. Think of the way in which we will exhibit the oneness of the body of Christ. And so Paul went on the road from church to church, taking a collection to aid the Christians of Jerusalem. He visited the churches of Macedonia, northern Greece. And to his surprise, he found poverty there that matched or even exceeded the poverty of the Jerusalem Christians for whom he was taking the offering. And suddenly, Paul loses his nerve. And he thinks... Well, I can't be asking these people to give because their lives are so meager at this point. But while Paul was there, word began to leak out that there was need in Jerusalem. And these impoverished Macedonian Christians, they ran to their minuscule resources and they pulled together a large offering. And they insisted that Paul take it to the church in Jerusalem. Now, in the first verse of our scripture lesson, Paul is writing to tell the Corinthians what he has just witnessed. And he writes, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. Now, what do you think is the motive for Christian giving? Well, we just heard it. The grace that, has, that God has given the Macedonians, the only acceptable motive for giving to God is in response to God's grace. Some of you may know the name of Bob McNair. He, he purchased the NFL football franchise in Houston many years ago. And many people thought that McNair had had taken leave of his senses. They couldn't believe the amount of money and they couldn't believe that he'd spent and why he did it. And he said, well, Houston has been good to me. And if I didn't love this city, then I wouldn't do it. I showed up here years ago with $700 to my name. Houston has been good to me. Now, Charlotte or Matthews may not have been that good to you, but God has. And our giving to God is in response to God's goodness and grace, which God pours into our lives every single day. Are you in touch with the grace of God in your life today? Can you think right now of tangible evidence of God's grace? I mean, every day I experience an outpouring of God's grace in my own life with my wife, Karen. I'm one of those very fortunate men who married way over my head. And after 38 years of marriage, friends, I still walk around with this silly grin on my face. God's grace comes to me every day through my marriage to my wonderful wife, Karen. For you, it may be through your spouse. So maybe it's your children or your grandchildren. I mean, did you know that We've had, the Wilsons have had two more grandchildren born in the, just the last few weeks. One of the things that I love about this church is that we have so many young families with children around here. You can always recognize them because they, they carry so much stuff around that they, they, they resemble to me like they're backpackers. I remember when our children were that age, my wife and I were tired all the time. I remember looking at people in their 50s and thinking to myself, why do they look younger than I feel? We could never get enough sleep. I remember one afternoon having responsibilities for our boys while Karen got some time away. And I remember putting the boys in their room and then I laid down on the carpet across the doorway and I went to sleep 
So if the boys tried to sneak out, they would have to trip over me and wake me up. Now, if you're a young couple, bless you and God hold you close. I know these days are difficult, especially, especially in a pandemic. But I promise you, you're going to snap your fingers and suddenly they're going to be in college or they're going to be getting married or they're going to be having babies. These are the days of grace in your life. If you're a single person, what would you do without the friendships that you've made here in the life of Matthews United Methodist? One person told me over the phone this week that if I were to yell, help, there would be an instant traffic jam on my street from all of my Matthews friends. God's grace abounds to us this very morning. Someone once asked Helen Keller, that if you had three days of your sight restored, what would you do? Now, having obviously thought about this, Ellen Keller said, well, on the first day, I would call my friends over and I would have them sit in my house with me. And then I would look long into their faces. And then I would study the face of a newborn baby. And then I would look into the eyes of my dogs, my faithful, loyal friends. And then I would take them for a walk in the woods. And then the next day, I would rise early and see the dawn. And then I would go to the museums and see sculptures and paintings. And that night, I would go to the ballet and I would watch the wonderful ballerina Pavlova. And on the third day, I would rise early once again, and I would drink in more of the world's beauty, and then I would go walking down the sidewalks of New York, and I would stop on a busy street corner, and I would watch people walk by, and then I would go to playgrounds and watch children play. And on the very last night of my restored vision, I would go to a comedy, and I would laugh, and I would laugh, and I would laugh. In other words, what Helen Keller would have done if she had sight are the very things that you and I take for granted every single day. May God heal us of our blindness to the abundance of grace which God pours upon us day by day Why even in a pandemic. The Macedonians gave from the grace of God that had been given to them. That means in this church, we don't give to budgets or to programs. I remember one time a layperson in the church saying to me, Chuck, I've got this whole thing figured out. We're going to figure out the cost of everything in the church for the next year. How much does it cost to air condition the church for a week? How much for the summer youth ministry? How much does it cost for a year of having choir? And we'll put all of that out for people to see. And then we'll take the bottom line of the total cost of the budget and we'll divide it by the number of family units in the church. And then we'll ask people to pay their fair share. Now, that's a brilliant idea, were it not so unchristian. Friends, we don't give to budgets. We don't give to programs. We don't give to pastors. We make a personal gift from our heart to say thank you to God for all that God has done for us. Well, Still more remarkable, the Apostle Paul goes on to say in our scripture lesson for today, verse 2, that the Macedonians had a gold-plated excuse for not giving. I mean, listen to what was going on in their lives. They they were suffering a severe ordeal of affliction. It was actually persecution. Persecution. as well as extreme poverty. Now, it would have been very easy for the Macedonians to say, well, Paul, why don't you catch us the next time around? 
Right now, our, our children, they've got growling tummies. Right now, we don't have enough to eat. And, and yet, because these people have been touched by the grace of God, you know, the very reasons they had for not giving to the Jerusalem Christians became the very reasons they did give to them. I mean, who knew better what those in Jerusalem were going through than did the Macedonians? I remember when I was in graduate school in California, and I volunteered to be a part of a group that was, that was operating phones for a hunger telethon that was being broadcast across the Los Angeles area. And we walked in to see this huge phone bank, and we were to sit there, and throughout this two-hour period of time, on behalf of World Vision, a world, a relief organization. And I learned pretty quickly that the phone calls, they didn't arrive in even intervals. They were, there were long periods with no phone calls at all, maybe just one or two. And then suddenly, here comes a tidal wave, and everything's happening at once. Now, in the studio, there was an entire wall that was covered with this map of Los Angeles with a little light showing where the calls originated. And you could see which part of the city was responding to the hunger telethon. You could, you could see the west side, you know, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, Marina Del Rey, Pacific Palisades, all of the wealthy zip codes of the L.A. area. And throughout those two hours, there would be a blink here and and there in those areas. But what I was not prepared for was that what kept those lights lit up like a Christmas tree for two hours were those calls that would come from Compton and Watts and the barrios and the poor neighborhoods of East L.A. And I couldn't believe it. We even had difficulty understanding all the different accents of the people that were calling in. And I said to the director, what's going on? And he said, Chuck, it's always that way. The poor give to the poor. The Macedonians gave to the Jerusalemites. They know how it feels. I read a statistic that said that in families with annual incomes of $20,000 or less, the percentage of giving to charitable causes is 3.1% of their incomes. Now, you would think that as the family income goes up, of course, that percentage of annual giving to charitable causes goes up as well. However, in families of those with incomes of $100,000 or more, giving drops to 1.6%. Is there not something wrong with that picture? Paul said the Macedonians outdid themselves in giving. Verse 3, for I can testify they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means. They gave until it hurt, and then they went right over their pain threshold. Verse 4 says, They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints of Jerusalem. I mean, you wonder if they were out of their minds. Probably a little. They had been touched by the grace of God. I was once with a wife and a husband who were making a very large gift to a church, a church that I was serving at the time. And when they told me the amount, I just sat there stunned. And they looked at each other and they started giggling. And then they looked at me and they said, Chuck, isn't this fun? I mean, their hearts had been touched by the grace of God. Now, how does this happen? Well, verse 5 goes on to tell us the secret. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. If God has all of you, then God has all you own. All of the giving that we do must be from the heart. A voluntary, spontaneous, overflowing in response to the grace and the love 
and the mercy of God. Recently, I heard of a family that was involved in habitat homes right here in Charlotte and Matthews back in the 1980s. And one man was so proud of all the efforts. And when one of the efforts was finished, one of those homes, he, he wanted so much for his wife and his daughter to see one of the particular homes. The man, the man had noticed that the Habitat family had a daughter about the same age as his daughter, who was eight. And so he wanted his daughter to meet this little girl who was now living in the Habitat home. So one day, the family... They got into their late model family car and they left their lovely home in South Charlotte and they drove to one of the poor areas of Charlotte. And they knocked on the Habitat House door and a little girl excitedly opened the door. And she took the other little girl by the hand and she said, oh, let me show you our house. This is our kitchen, and this is our living room. Let me show you my room. And then she turned to the little girl from South Charlotte, and she said, isn't it big? Now, of course, the little girl from South Charlotte was thinking, well, no. And as they were about to leave, the little girl, living in the Habitat home, took the other little girl to one side and said, do you get to have a house like this? And the little girl from South Charlotte said, no. And the other girl was just crestfallen and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. You see, friends, her heart had been touched by the grace of God and now she wanted to share that grace with her new friend. During these days, will you let God's grace touch your heart? If so, there will be many, many more little girls just like her. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, touch us with your grace this day that, that we might be more like the Macedonians, more like the little girl in the Habitat house. And we thank you that you ask us to give, not so much because you want us to meet the needs of others as much as because you want something wonderful to happen to us that we might become more gracious, more loving, more relaxed, more like Jesus. Oh God, I thank you for this church's great generosity because without which we would not be who we are. And we pray that you would fill our hearts with joy until they overflow so that we would get the giggles in our giving. And that we would be cheerful in our giving. And that we would truly know the grace of Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your Now, friends, go forth into the world to love God and to love like God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We're grateful that you're here with us at Matthews United Methodist, and we hope you feel deeply blessed by our time together. We invite you to join us again next Sunday Facebook or YouTube or in one of our many services. Be sure to connect with our life-changing ministries on our website as well. Thanks.